Welcome to the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast. Hi, I'm David Manti with Cannabis Equipment News, and with me today is Dr. David Kunick, CEO and founder of UCS Advisors. Thanks a lot for joining me today, Dr. David. Uh, thanks for having me, David. I really do appreciate it. So tell me a little bit about your background. Um, it's my understanding that you're a bit of a serial entrepreneur. I think it was uh, seven new companies in five different states at one point. For cannabis, yes, that's correct. And uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, by trade, I'm actually a doctor of physical therapy, and I hold a second doctorate in healthcare management. I've been very blessed to have started actually 13 companies in the past 18 years, and I've wow. sold seven of those companies. I got involved in cannabis back in 2009, and I actually took my company public, and we were one of the first 1,500 publicly traded companies here in the United States, which is pretty cool and pretty amazing. Now that's 2021. And over that time frame, I've actually started seven different cannabis companies in five different states. I've sat on three different state boards to help uh, with the medical laws for medical cannabis. And I actually originally started off in the testing lab sector. We didn't grow cannabis, we didn't sell cannabis, but rather we tested it in, um, as a medical professional. And as someone who used to own a bunch of uh, pain management centers and physical therapy clinics, it's really about educating and empowering the patients about all their options. And medical cannabis is part of those options. So tell me a bit about the first endeavor into the cannabis industry. Uh, was that a testing lab? No, actually, uh, oddly enough, we were actually an online platform for health and wellness okay. for people and for their pets. Oh, and interesting. About 65% of Americans have a dog or a cat. Mm -hmm. So we were covering uh, about 100 articles every day on health and wellness with about 20 to 30% of those articles about the benefits of CBD, not only for humans, but also for dogs. Okay. And we're also talking about the benefits of CBD and also benefits of medical uh, cannabis for, for uh, patients here in the United States. And that's how we start off in the sector. From there, we got involved in the testing lab sector. Um, from there, we got involved in a vaporizer company. From there, got involved in a cannabis newsletter company. And then we helped out a few grow operations and dispensaries as well, too. I mean... You've already had, uh, you've already founded more companies than I've worked for in my career. So, uh, you know, where do you get the drive, man? Ooh, um, maybe because I get from my, my, my father, I will say he's, he's a, he's a tough, stubborn man from Boston, Mass. Um, okay. and being the youngest of four kids, uh, we, I was really taught a lot of a very difficult work, work ethic, but realistically speaking, I also think it's just personally speaking, I've, I've had to overcome a lot. Here we are having an, a conversation. I, I was actually born with severe verbal apraxia. So I used to only be able to hum words. Oh, wow. And I actually went to a speech therapist when I was 23 years old. And now really? here I am doing public speaking. I, I was um, a big time basketball player till I blew up my knee in high school. Mm -hmm. um, had several reconstructive knee surgeries. Had another one in college. I, I Not only am I a doctor of physical therapy, on my own body, I've received over eight years of physical therapy. At one point for a little bit, I was going to school in a wheelchair for a month or two. So okay. just overcoming all those things. And really, it's just it's about paying it forward. And mm -hmm. it's about knowing what goals you have. And something we say here, my current company, UCS Advisors and Investor Relations is always be willing to achieve your greatness. Okay. David, we all have greatness within us. Mm -hmm. And your definition of greatness might be different than my definition of greatness. First might be, you know, your wife's definition of greatness, but are you willing to achieve it? Right. And most people are free to go out and, and achieve that greatness. And I think that's kind of where some of that motivation really, really co co comes into it. And, and if I were to take a step further, I went from, from treating patients and healing people with my hands, which is pretty cool when you really think about it. Right. To, you know, after people having those surgeries or having a stroke, it's not the doctor that teaches a patient how to walk again. It's not the doctor who teaches the patient how to get on and off a toilet again. It's us. It's us mm -hmm. therapists who are doing that. So yeah. to be able to help people that way, then to be able to start companies and employ people, mm -hmm. that's something we're very proud of. Right now, 13 of our former employees all own their own companies now. Oh, wow. In 2010, we actually won... Uh, me and my, uh, my uh, business partner won the Alfred Sloan Award for workplace programs and workplace flexibility. We were honored as one of the top 15% of small businesses to work for in America. Wow. And it's about giving people that power mm -hmm. and that ability 
to further themselves, to help them reach their greatness. So the way I look at it is I did it on a, on a town level. Then I did it on a county level. Then I did it on a state level, then a regional. And now I'm trying to do it on a national level. So that's interesting to me. And uh, one, one point on the work ethic is uh, growing up in the Midwest, I definitely can appreciate the importance of growing up with a strong work ethic and how that can help you moving forward. Um, one thing I'm interested in, though, is how are you able to, you know, when you're working with individual patients with your hands and you can kind of see them as they progress and you're kind of helping them build, build to a better life, you know, how was it that you were able to say, like, this isn't enough for me. I want to go and help, you know, on that county, on that state, on the national level, so to speak. So great question. Um, I think that goes back to maybe some of my, my goals. I, I knew since I was 16 years old, I want to be a physical therapist. I knew I want to open up my own clinics before the age of 30. I knew I want to open up multiple clinics. And my goal back then was to um, retire by the age of 35. Okay. Now that was being a naive 16 year old in reality, though, everything I want to achieve in the physical therapy world with opening clinics, expanding clinics and being with something, I accomplished that by the time I was 32 at 32, I achieved everything I want to achieve in the physical therapy world. I had a contract for uh, a professional uh, soccer team. I had the contract for a former NFL team. I've taken care of Olympic athletes. Like I've done some pretty cool stuff. I'll be the first yeah. to admit to it. Um, but everything I want, I achieved is just the next steps. Yeah. And I, I was given an opportunity to start a company on health and wellness and to start covering the cannabis sector. Okay. And I used to live in the state of Maine and the state of Maine has had medical marijuana since 1999. Yeah. That's the second longest state. Yeah. And so yeah. when I started my physical therapy career in the state of Maine, we were already talking about the benefits of medical marijuana. Mm -hmm. So then when I moved back to the New York, New Jersey area, I already knew the benefits of medical marijuana. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, for me, it's just a very natural progression. And trust me, back in 2009, when I was raising money for my, my public trade company for cannabis, it wasn't cool to be in cannabis back then compared to oh, what yeah. it is now. <laughs> no, uh, with that, with those pain management clinics, was cannabis a part of the uh, pain management solutions? At that time, no. The New okay. Jersey program wasn't really, and the New York program really wasn't up to date yet. Um, it's something where we could refer people to websites mm -hmm. or other areas, but no, we were not allowed to, to do anything. Okay. So with that opportunity, was, that, was there anything else that drew you to cannabis? Part of it's right time, right place, to be very frank. Yeah. Um, and really... It was actually one of my mentors in cannabis when I first started getting involved. Mm -hmm. um, out of uh, privacy, I won't say her name. Okay. Um, but she, I was hiding me being in the medical field. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't very proud to be in the medical field and talking about cannabis. Mm -hmm. And one day she pulled me over to the side at a conference. This is maybe circa 2012, 2013. And she's like, Dr. David, we need more people like you. Mm -hmm. Reread the medical code of ethics. And she pointed out two key parts in the medical code of ethics. One is, which is I already knew, empower your patients with information and knowledge. And you have to show them every possible treatment mm -hmm. for them. That includes cannabis. Right. So we're supposed to do that. And then secondly speaking, it says in the medical code of ethics that if there's a better treatment option for the patient, that it's upon your um, duty as a medical provider to fight for that patient's right, even if it's against the federal standards. Mm -hmm. And that's what was really interesting. And once we really had that big heart to heart and she's like, he have, you have two doctor degrees. Like you, you have to take care of all your, like you have this platform mm -hmm. and you know, you're not some fly by night person. You're not some person who for, I hate to say some stoner, who now is just getting involved in the industry. And like, no, you actually know what you're doing. You know what you're talking about. Um, I joke around about the endocannabinoid system mm -hmm. because when I went back to my uh, anatomy book from college, I, I see it actually had that part highlighted. <laughs> in <reviews. laughs> so I'm like, okay. So, but, um, so really it, 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 it took me a while to embrace it. Uh, I'll okay. be the first one to admit to it in the beginning. Um, I was wearing two hats. I was Dr. David, the well-known physical therapist who's taking care of all these high-end athletes in New Jersey, New York. 
but outside the tri-state area of New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, I was known as Dr. David who wore the pot leaf jacket at all the conferences around the country. Right. So I was wearing right. two hats for quite some time. So, you know, comparing your struggle to embrace that role or the influence and power of cannabis, how can you, like, could you compare that to sort of what the nation is going through right now where there are so many seeming benefits and a lot of people uh, benefiting from both medical and recreational use uh, compared to sort of like what mainstream culture still thinks about it? Sure. And um, I take a different stance than okay. most people do. And mm -hmm. it might, my stance might upset some people, but remember I'm a medical provider first. That's why I always tell people I'm a medical professional first. And I take a medical approach towards business. Personally speaking, if we're going to view this as a medicine, then all 50 States need to get medical first. Mm -hmm. It's plain and simple. Uh, do I think there's a benefit for recreational? Yes, I do. I'm not saying there isn't, but if we're going to truly view this as a medicine, then let's have all 50 States get medical first. Okay. And then the recreation will kind of come along. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, and like, I, I think what happened in South Dakota was really interesting about the passing of both re recreational and medical at the same exact time. It really says a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, I, I really think we need to push medical first mm -hmm. and view it as a, as a medicine first, then recreation will come into place. When we try to blur those lines, that's where we struggle. And that's yeah. where it's much tougher to, to, you, to move this process forward. Yeah. Do you think that uh, that's part of the problem that, you know, people look at recreational, they look at tax revenue and they're st they don't look at how it can improve individual lives. Exactly mm -hmm. that. And, um, and also too, uh, the States in general, and I'll use um, New Jersey as an example, New York as an example, they made it so difficult for physicians to actually give out and prescribe the medicine. And then they were getting shunned or blackballed in their own uh, um, professional community for prescribing cannabis. Mm -hmm. Now things are a, little, a lot more laissez-faire. Uh, things are a lot more simplistic. It's a lot, a lot more conditions that you can actually can get cannabis for. But that was also part of the struggle too, where doctors didn't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they didn't want to talk about it all. And one of my favorite examples, I do a lot of work with chiropractors I do a lot of work with orthopedic surgeons. I do a lot of work with primary care physicians. And I also have a lot of them as clients who are investors of mine. Uh, and we help them invest in the cannabis and, and hemp and CBD industry. But it was only really in the last two or three years, they're kind of saying, okay, if you're going to use medical cannabis, let us know. Okay. Hey, you know what? It's okay to talk if you're going to use medical cannabis. Or uh, as, as one of my, my clients, he's, um, he's, he's, a phys he's an orthopedic surgeon and he specializes in shoulders. Mm -hmm. And he jokes around now because in the, he, joke, he literally says in the last two years, Dr. David, when I talk to, the, to my, my patients, I say, okay, do you want an opiate painkiller or are you using medical cannabis now? And he, he's, it took him a while though, to actually incorporate that in his everyday speech with patients. Mm -hmm. Well, that was uh, a point I wanted to bring up. You know, with that pain, those pain management clinics, were you working a lot with opiates or was it more physical therapy based? So the pain management clinics... Um, we were working with pain management doctors, occupational therapists, acupuncturists, and also okay. there was a physical therapy side of it too. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that we would really stress is that you're, for pain management, that's only kind of still at the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. You don't need to run and go get an injection right away. You don't need to pop a pill right away. There are alternatives. There's physical therapy. There's exercise. There's acupuncture. There's chiropractic where... Let's use a true medical team approach. And, and that goes back to, and people say, why is your company UCS Advisors? Why don't you just call yourself consultants? And I tell people all the time, a consultant works on one problem, specifically retroactively. Mm -hmm. While an advisor uses a multidisciplinary approach and looks at every aspect, mm -hmm. while also having real life experience as well, too. And that's where, when we go back and go back to your question about the pain management clinics, we really want patients to know, okay, you shouldn't run and get that injection right away. You shouldn't run and take those pills right away. You know, that's just putting a bandaid on it. We actually want to fix the problem. Well, and uh, you mentioned the difference between consultants and advisors. I think it's also important to mention that the UCS stands for, you know, use cannabis safely. Yes. And it also means for the non-cannabis clients, use common sense. 
So <laughs> it, 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 it has two things, but yes, UCS stands for use Canvas safely. And then for our non-Canvas clients, um, we say uh, use common sense. Man, if the nation could just listen to the use common sense a little bit more, I think we'd all be in a better place. <laughs> it, I, I fully agree with you on that. And, and, and that goes back to also too, for, for your listeners, you know, we joke around with people, especially because we help people raise money for their companies. Yeah. And we help people get money. We, one of the things we say, use common sense. Make sure you check your voicemail every day. Make sure yeah. your voicemail is not full. And people are like, well, what do you mean? I go, if someone's going to write you a check for $100,000, let's say. Yeah. They can't leave you a voicemail. You know, that doesn't give them a, a sense of security or like, hey, like, I can't get a hold of this person. Right. They can't even be reached. Um, exactly. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about. Um, so how has your interaction been with uh, other people in the industry? How are they using your services, uh, <clears throat> using your services currently? So great question. And it's, it's a two part answer. OK. The most simplistic part is for companies that are just starting out. Mm -hmm. or just a, generating a couple million dollars in revenue and they need help to secure capital, they hire us by the hour and okay. we help them with their pitch deck. We help them with their presentation. Most people, David, don't know how to talk to an investor. Mm -hmm. Most people don't know why someone says no. Right. So they come to us and we teach them how to do that properly. And then we actually get them in front of proper investors to actually raise money for them. Mm -hmm. And also too, it's also to kind of teach them like, Great example is there's a lot of people in cannabis who say, oh, I need $2 million. I go, great. How much of the $2 million do you need in the next 60 days? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Well, what if you only really need a million dollars? You make enough money. You don't need the other million. Oh, maybe I could do that. It's let's break it down for you. Then the second part of what we do is unfortunately here in America, if you are a, the average hardworking middle-class American, like you and I are, we're screwed by the system when it comes to investing. If you go to your financial awesome. advisor, yeah. They can't tell you any private deal to invest in. And there's a lot of cannabis stocks they can't tell you about to invest either. They'll say, oh, put something in. They'll make maybe 2% or 5% a year if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, uh, there's so many cannabis deals out there that also too, a lot of people don't have an extra hundred to $150,000 laying around to invest in something. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we actually go out and we vet deals. And we actually okay. find deals for our investors and our clients. And okay. what we do is we find deals that meet their investment criteria, as well as we find them uh, different ways that they can invest their money, what, what works best for them. And we do that with both people, both uh, domestically and internationally, but we take it a step further, which is really important for to hear this next part, David. Mm -hmm. Something we also do too, is that if you're in the military, if you're work for the government, if you're a police, if you're fire, fire department, you really can't invest directly into a cannabis company. You're okay. usually not allowed. Every state has different rules and regs. So why should you be punished and not be able to take advantage of the opportunity? So what we've also done too is we've worked out a program where people can invest directly with us, UCS advisors, okay. and we do the investment for them. But we tell them ahead of time what the return on investment is. Okay. No blaming the markets. No blaming the, the president. No blaming the Senate. No blaming COVID. We mm -hmm. tell you point blank, you put X money in, you get Y money back in this time frame. If you don't, we actually pay you a penalty. Oh, wow. So it's a nice, easy way for people to start to learn how to invest in this industry. And also, too, also for non-accredited investors, David. I mean, that's the one thing about the Canvas community. If you have a criminal record, mm -hmm. which a lot, these amount of people do in the Canvas sector, mm -hmm. you are not allowed to invest in certain opportunities. Mm -hmm. They will not take your money. And you bridge that gap. We do bridge that gap. And, and the other thing is too, what I like to say is that when's the last time you gave someone like our lowest investments, $5,000. Mm -hmm. When's the last time someone said, David, if you give $5,000, I'm going to give you a 30% return on investment in 15 months or less. That means yeah. you're, you're making 1500 bucks extra. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, the return sounds incredible. And it also sounds like you're carrying a fair amount of risk on your end. We assume all the risk. We assume yeah. 100% of the risk. The way we actually set, set it up is we're giving you 30% in 15 months or less. Mm -hmm. you know, we can give you the 30% back in six months, nine months, 11 months. But guess what? If we screw up and it takes more than 15 months, then we have to pay you an extra 2.5% interest per month. And oh. people say, well, what's the guarantee? Uh, well, we're like, well, our bank account will show you we can cover this. And secondly, yeah. go to your financial advisor. 
and tell him, will you guarantee a 10% return? He'll say no. Mm-hmm. Say, well, if, if, if it's less than that, will, will, will you pay the difference? No financial advisor will say yes to that. Not at all. Right. So this really helps bridge the gap for people. So uh, one of the things that I found interesting, I think it was the first time that we met, uh, you talked about the number of cannabis companies that are from first time, you know, people, people getting into business for the first time, starting up the first shop. Uh, talk a little bit about that and some of the, you know, sort of problems that wind up popping up as these unexperienced people try starting their own business. Sure. And I'm, I'm happy you brought that part. So it's the unofficial stat, but it's an estimated 65% of business owners in cannabis and CBD are first time business owners. Mm-hmm. And I hear people say, oh, because it's a brand new industry and that's total bullshit. Mm-hmm. Okay. And the reason I say that is that, David, do you like pizza? I mean, look at me. No, yes, of course. It, I like yeah. pizza too. It doesn't mean I'm going to go open up a pizza parlor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I mean, I've, I've owned personal training clinics, but I work out four days a week. It doesn't mean I'm going to open up another personal, or another gym. Right, right. So, so the other thing is that we always tell clients what we call our green nuggets of information. Green okay. nugget number one, failure to plan is planning to fail. Mm-hmm. And what we always see, the biggest issue is people are not thinking three or four steps ahead. Mm-hmm. And we, and what we tell people also too, the second uh, green nugget is free only gets you so far. When you get okay. free advice from a lawyer, from an accountant, it's only going to get you so far. Mm-hmm. We get free advice from an advisor. It's only going to get you so far. Mm-hmm. So we have to tell people, you need to think ahead of time. You know, what's your exit strategy? If you need money from an investor and, and we give, we give the high school analogy uh, so David, you have kids when, 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 when you're, when one of your, one of your kids turns 18 years old, they want to go to college. Are you going to hand them a check for $250,000 and say, go to college for four years. Here's $250,000. I trust you. Would you do that? No, Hell no, no. <laughs> so why would an investor give you money if yeah. you don't have a clear plan on right. how you're going to pay them back? What's mm. going to happen? And, and the other thing we tell people, especially in the cannabis community is, People say, well, I'm going to get acquired. I'm going to get acquired. And I go, great. Less than 13% of all companies get acquired. Interesting. It's not a very big number. Mm -hmm. Do you think that number would increase with federal legalization? Go down. Go down. Because what's going to happen is is that you're going to see the larger players Mm -hmm. try to, to run the small business out of town. Mm-hmm. or just pay pennies on the dollar for it. Right. Um, and, and I'll give you a great example. Um, not to get into politics, but let's talk about the Affordable Health Care Act. Mm-hmm. The Affordable Health Care Act was going to shake up the business, uh, the medical community if you generated less than $10 million a year in your practice. Mm-hmm. We, my, me and my business partner, we knew that ahead of time, that January 1st, 2014, all the rest of the rules and regulations for affordable, for the Affordable Health Care Act was going to hit us. Talking with brokers and doing and, and talking with other advisors to get the most amount of money for our clinic, we needed to sell before January 1st, 2014, which is what we did. Okay. And we got made fun of a lot by a lot of our, our colleagues. But in 2014 and 2016, about 50 to 60% of our colleagues either went bankrupt or sold for less than 25 cents on the dollar. Oh, man. So okay. you have to have that forward thinking. Okay. Um, and that goes back to exit strategy, David, just so you know. Yeah, okay. Okay. I mean, uh, well, I mean, certainly somebody that's had, you know, uh, seven different cannabis companies in five different states. I mean, you're definitely a person that not only plans, but, you know, knows how long you're going to be in that specific business for. Well, exactly. You need to, you kind of have that plan of attack. Mm-hmm. And it's also um, like, like I believe it was Warren Buffett who said, it's okay to hit a bunch of singles. And, and a great example is we, we helped open up a, uh, a canvas company in uh, the state of Maine. Okay. And we only own 25% of it. Mm-hmm. And we made a deal with the, uh, the, the majority business owner where if he could pay us X amount of money within two years, we would decrease our ownership down to 5%. Okay. And that's what he did because it made him happy. It's a very fair deal too, where that's the other thing is too, when you talk about um, p- 
people being new to this industry, people say no to investors all the time because it's not the ideal deal they want. Instead mm -hmm. of taking a step back and trying to think outside the box to make all parties happy. Okay. So, and, and we knew too where this client was that we would make the most amount of money in the first two or three years. So we had that forward thinking ahead of time. Were these, um, were these companies all dispensaries? No, not at okay. all. Um, so what other we've done, we've done extraction labs, we've done testing labs, we've done vaporizers, we've done grow facilities. Okay. Of the many, of the seven different ventures, what was the most difficult to be a part of? Testing lab. Why is that? Um, well, one, we were one of the first testing labs in the state of Nevada mm -hmm. and we were two, almost two years too early to market. Okay. Where the state of Nevada was taking, um, or I should say Nevada, sorry, um, was taking so long to write the rules and regulation mm -hmm. that all the testing labs had to come together and actually form the cannabis, uh, the Nevada Cannabis uh, Testing Lab Association to help the state write the rules and regulations. Because all we were doing was just losing money every single month waiting for the rules and regs. Oh, man. And it was very frustrating. Um, the amount uh, back then being in the testing lab community wasn't as advantageous or financially great. Um, we were almost... In hindsight, we went about 400% over budget. Okay. That's, that's, and that, that's a tough pill to swallow to your investors. Right, right. That, that and also, too, when you're running a publicly traded company, mm -hmm. you don't have the final say. Mm -hmm. You have to deal with your board of directors. Right. And, and that always makes things different because people always ask, you know, Dr. David, you know, what if, if you could redo one thing, what would it be? And I'm very happy with all the experiences I've had. The only thing I would ever change is I would, I took a leave of absence for being the chairman of my board of directors mm -hmm. and I was supposed to get it back within 18 months and mm -hmm. I was never given it back. Oh man. Um, and that's where I really saw um, the company start to go downhill, mm -hmm. inherit new board members, which I did not think were a good fit for us. We got, um, several additional investors, which I did not think were good for our company and did not have the best interests of our company either. Got out voted for that as well too. And that's pretty much one of the main reasons why I actually left that. Got to a point where I had enough investors who said, we're making, we made enough money from you. The minute you leave and open up your own shop, we'll follow you. And when I'm, you have people doing that, that says a lot. Absolutely. No, it's uh, well, it sounds like uh, you prove it. You know, you have your track record and uh, that builds that loyalty. It does. It does. I mean, I, I went, being in Canvas for over a decade, um, it's really great to see how much industry has grown. I, I'm very excited to see uh, the people who are still around and yeah. doing great things. And it's also kind of like, hey, I, I knew you when. And <clears throat> and also too, it's just really great to see how much industry has has really grown. But um, to to sit here and say I don't know the dirty side behind everything and all the politics that goes on and to see how you can get screwed over really badly. No, I, it's happened to me. I've seen it firsthand, but I survived it. You know, uh, mm -hmm. I, for me, the glass is always half full, not half empty. Well, did you experience that sort of ruthless nature of the business and then, you know, sort of use that as how you would operate your businesses going forward to make sure you kind of never fell into the same trap again and never ran your shop the same way? So it's great, it's great you say that. So my, my actually my first two physical therapy jobs out of college, I, I worked with for, uh, horrible bosses. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I started my own company, my, my, my very first physical therapy clinic. I made sure I didn't do anything that they did. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to, to cannabis around the companies, I really try to adopt a lot of the same principles. But once again, when you're running a public trade company and you want to make a huge change to the company, you need the board director's vote. Yep. Not everyone saw eye to eye on that. Um, but when it comes to just in general doing business, once again, uh, maybe I'm a little old school, um, you know, do a lot of handshakes, you know, uh, your word is your bond. And the one thing I think it's really interesting, and uh, there's someone uh, by the name of Chris Vaglio, um, great guy. He, he's, he uh, owns a company called uh, Rocket Growth Agency, helps with personal branding. Great guy. And he's known me for all 13 of my companies. Okay. And he's referred me business to all 13 of my companies. And, okay. I, and maybe like a year and a half, two years ago, I'm like, Chris, I go, 
you know, you've always referred me business to matter what company I, I have. I'm like, why is that? He's like, your business ethics and your business morals. Mm-hmm. He's like, you have such good business ethics. I don't need to worry about any, anyone when I refer them to you. And that really, and that really hit home to me. Oh yeah. No, to have a... someone say, cause of your business ethics. Yeah. And if you really have proper business ethics and business standards, that goes a long way. Yeah. It's an incredible testament to your character. Um, now, given the role that you're at with UCS, and are, do you miss being sort of on the ground level? Uh, you know, at the at an extraction lab, at a cultivation facility, at a dispensary, do you miss sort of like, you know, being on the front line of the industry? So I would never consider myself being on the front line of the industry. To be okay. Frank. Um, I, I wouldn't consider myself that. Do I miss? Going to the dispensaries, doing staff meetings, following up with people. Do I miss hearing from all the employees? I mean, at one point, I had over 300 employees, 300 employees around the country. Wow. And whether you're the guy who makes 20 bucks an hour, or 15 bucks an hour, or your person who's making 200 grand a year, everyone gets treated the same. Mm-hmm. And it's always, hey, how can we, what, what can we do to make you stay here? Like, I live in the golden bubble where when, when I hire you, you know, I want you with me for the next 5, 10, 15 years. I want to motivate you that you don't want to leave. You know, if yeah. your goal is maybe to open up your own business in five to six years, great. Pick our brands as much as you, as much as you can so we can help you achieve your goal. Mm-hmm. Um, I, do miss, I do miss that part um, in, ter- in terms of that. But the other part I do miss is um, it was actually until COVID, I was actually still treating patients about 10 hours a week. Oh, um, just because it, I have a skill set, I have a trade. I still like treating patients. Is that mm-hmm. the full time gig? No, it hasn't been the full time gig for a very, very long time. Yeah, but I will say this is the longest I've been without actually uh, treating someone, which has been odd. Yeah, no, it's it's not the same because it's patients. But like uh, in college, I used to do construction, and there was something to be said about being able to pass a house and say, you know what, they have a roof because I put it on, and that's kind of cool. You know, where like you feel like you're doing something, be it at a small level for let's call it the greater good. And you got to kind of see past that to see like, okay, we could do this at a larger level. Um, well, one thing that well, you had I mentioned. Mean, D- David, oh, a great example is because mm-hmm. people laugh. People are like, why do you, like, you have a dishwasher? Why do you like washing dishes? And I go, it sounds silly. I go, it's relaxing. And secondly, I go, when it's done, it's done and it's clean. Like, what do you mean? I go, well, when you're raising money and you're, and you're doing this, it's always constantly moving. When you own companies, like, it's not like, oh, hey, this task is completely done and over with. No, it's constantly revolving, constantly moving. You wash dishes, you clean them, you dry them, they're done. Yeah. It's like, okay, it's a sense of accomplishment. There's nothing more to be done to it. And people yeah. are like, oh, I never really thought of it that way. I'm like, so I kind of get what you say. Like, like my friends joke around, they go, why do you want to help me? you know, with my leaves and rake my leaves in my yard with me. And I'm like, well, one, I don't have a yard. So and I miss doing that. But it's also just a sense of accomplishment. Like, hey, yeah, we did something together. No, I feel the same way. Only it's my approach towards uh, cooking, uh, where it's just, just let me have the space for a minute. Don't get in the way of the knife. It's going to be, a, you know, it's going to hopefully turn out. We've had a few, we've had a few misses in the kitchen, but they're rare. <laughs> um, one, one thing that you had mentioned is that you sit on three state boards. Uh, what are those states and uh, what have you accomplished as a result of those positions? Um, so actively now, it's just one. Okay. But over the course of I was three, it was um, the, the testing lab board in the state of Nevada. Um, it was the medical board in the state of Maine and also helped out in the state of New Jersey as well, too. Okay. Um being on that sort of regulatory side of things, were you disappointed or encouraged with how they were approaching uh, cannabis legislation? Depends what state you're in, to be very frank. Yeah. Um, and, and it really comes down to um, the state you're in, your fellow board members that are with you and how they view things. Um, and really the mindset on what the goal is at hand. The one thing is that I tell people is it comes down to also your experience, because if you're on the board with people that have no cannabis experience at all, you're, it's like teaching someone in first grade how to do geometry. It's, okay. It's such a, it's such a learning curve. Right. And then on top of that too. And one thing I always say, when people compare everything to Colorado or California, I'm like, Colorado's a guinea pig state and California. Mm-hmm. Well, 
California is like the true democracy of, of cannabis. Like take away those two states and let's look at the other states. Um, and, and that's something I, you know, it, that people just don't always think about. And it gets to a point where you cannot make everyone happy. Mm-hmm. I hate to say it, but not everyone's going to be happy. And as a collective group, and I'm not trying to put an objective number on it, but it's like, okay, if we can make 70% or 75% of the people happy, maybe we move forward. Right. Or do we try to make 90% of the people happy? And then we move forward. But getting that, that everyone on the same page, that, that's the most difficult part. I was actually, uh, that leads me to a question I wanted to ask, you know, because Colorado and California are sort of outliers beyond those two, what states are doing it right in your opinion and what states are falling down right now? So I think you're asking a very loaded question because okay. it'd be more of medical versus recreational. Okay. Are we talking the growers versus testing labs? So I'm going to take a step back to kind of answer your question in general. Mm-hmm. In the country, we need to come up with standardized testing procedures. Mm-hmm. The fact that one state requires 11 tests, but the next state requires three tests, not good. The fact that one state says, okay, you can test up to 100 pounds of one strain, and while another state says, no, we're going to take a test of up to 10 pounds per strain. So if you grow 100 pounds of the same strain, we got to run 10 different tests on it. Mm-hmm. There's too much inconsistency. Okay. So that's the one thing that we really need to do right off the bat. Um, I will say the other thing is too, that it's a very difficult topic is expungement of criminal records. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, that's extremely, extremely uh, difficult. And that's not an easy topic to have, but I will say overall is that regardless of your opinion of it is all their legislatures and our elected officials really need to listen to the people. And that's one thing I think I find very interesting. And, and once again, using uh, South Dakota, uh, which, which is happening about, you know, they, they're, they want to overturn the ruling, even for the medical side, they're, they're getting uh, their balls busted. But over, I think it was over 70% of the community voted yes to medical. Right. Listen to the people, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that's what I think is really interesting. Mm-hmm. is how the political officials you're a voted official in you're mm-hmm. supposed to listen to the people and if the people voted this way it's regardless if you're pro or against it you should do the right thing and listen to what the community says okay and uh yeah no i apologize for the loaded question i guess i get so used to speaking about the industry on a state by state basis that talking about you know even standardizing testing across the board for medicinal use, that still, I guess, seems so far out there for me, uh, which is why I kind of look at it state by state. Well, what I think is interesting, you bring up a good point, is that if we were to look what um, Governor Cuomo did in New York, bringing together some of the other governors in the New England and tri-state area, Mm -hmm. when they had their little powwow, part of that powwow was, okay, if if we're all going to do this, how can we kind of make sure we're all kind of having the same rules and regulations in place to make it more, to make it easier? Mm-hmm. Because the one thing that is a big difference is the West coast, you know, you got pretty large States out there. True. And as I like to tell people that the surface area of new England is half the surface area of the entire West coast, mm-hmm. but twice the size and population. Mm-hmm. So people are going across States all the time. I mean, look at California, it's going to take you, what, seven hours to drive from Northern California to Southern California. But in seven hours, you can go from Philly to, to New York, to, to Boston, to Maine. That's, yeah. That's a lot. Pending of traffic. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried, you know, I tried doing that, uh, the drive from uh, Madison to Manhattan once. And it was just, I did it once. Once. <laughs> then it was mass I, I, transit. I've, I've given the drive. I've get, I've done the drive out to uh, Detroit, Michigan, about seven times. Okay. So okay. I've done Indiana. I've done Georgia a few times. You know, but myself usually, if it, once I get to the eight-hour mark, that's when I get antsy. <laughs> so is uh is UCS the final stop for you, or uh, what do you think in terms of like uh, career-wise going forward? It's a great question. Uh, UCS advisors. Um, will be around probably for at least five more years. Mm-hmm. Uh, in general, if when it comes to making 
in uh, capital and really earning the most amount of money in this cannabis sector, we really feel you have until pretty much the middle of 2022, end of 2022 to get involved. Okay. No, no, you can still get involved past 2022. Just uh, you're not going to see that the, the return on investment as high as it is now. Okay. Just, just plain and simple. And the cost into the market is going to become even higher. But to answer your question more directly for UCS advisors, really um, the goal is by 2024, actually July, 2024 is to do all our own uh, investing ourselves. Okay. Um, make it more like a, a Mark Lamonis of like the profit. Um, we actually have a, a key contact uh, with Dame, uh, with Damon John of shark tank. Oh, um, yeah. uh, actually uh, the person who oversees all his shark tank companies um, we have a contact with, we've actually done work with uh, Kevin Harrington, one of the original sharks from shark tank where mm-hmm. It's really just taking all their own capital and infusing it into other companies. Okay. And, and that's where something too, where when people invest directly with us here at UCS Advisors, some of the deals we have are with some of these private companies where they also engage with us to help their companies grow as well too. So okay. that's, that's really the next stage. Um, so Cannabis Equipment News specifically operates as a trade publication, trying to cover technologies, best practices that, you know, extractors, processors, manufacturers, food manufacturers can use to improve their business going forward. Since you've had a role in many of these different companies, where are, what is your take on it from like a technology standpoint in terms of what the kind of technology people are using on the plant floor right now and what could be used or maybe that even needs to be scaled back? So great question. And my very first piece of advice, which was given to me about two years ago, one, the technology is changing nonstop. Mm -hmm. Okay. The second thing is you might want to get a really good mechanical engineer, chemical engineer as a, as a consultant, not as an advisor, but as a consultant. So before you go out and purchase some of these new pieces of equipment, Mm -hmm. go pay a few hundred bucks have an engineer look at it, ask the proper engineering questions. Um, I actually am now part of a civil chemical mechanical engineering group that meets once every 60 days. Okay. And half the stuff they talk about is way over my head, Mm -hmm. but they're now talking about for the last year, all the equipment being used in cannabis and and in extraction. And they're talking about the issues they're talking about the lack of standardization. They're mm-hmm. talking about, hey, if this piece of equipment, what they're saying might not be accurate. Right. And I'll take it a step further where we had an investor who's a chemical engineer talk to a CBD company. Mm-hmm. And the CBD company said they had the latest, greatest technique and talked about molecules and splitting molecules. Mm-hmm. They didn't realize they're talking to a chemical engineer who pretty much ran circles around them. Yeah. And yeah. they're like, the equipment you have is actually outdated and will be even further outdated in the next six months. So yeah. that's, that's something where we're now telling people you might want to spend a little bit of money mm-hmm. on that. Uh, the other thing is too, is in terms of co- uh, being cost efficient, start also um, building your war chest or your network of people that sell uh, refurbished or used lab equipment or just equipment generally, because it's amazing how much this equipment gets tossed to the side after a couple of years, but you could still use it. Well, we, I hear that. I've heard that on multiple podcasts. I've heard that from interviews and talking to people um, at shows, how much of that equipment is just in the corner collecting dust because it was either too big, not necessary, didn't work correctly. It just feels like a lot of waste out there still. There is. And, and, and that's also where it's, this goes back to your business plan. This goes back to green nugget. Number one, failure to plan is planning to fail. Uh, great example. Uh, we right now we're working with a new extraction lab company for hemp and they found some equipment that they wanted and they go, Oh, but I can get this, this latest, greatest piece of equipment, but it's gonna cost another $900,000. If I get these three other items, I'm like, no, we're going to start smaller for you. Start to build in your profit. And then we'll look at the other pieces of equipment. We don't need to go boss the wall right away. Okay. And, and that's why I tell people if, if you're running a huge operation, you know, 20, 30, 40 million, then yeah, you might want to go that route. But if you're starting smaller and a lot of people are, are starting smaller, you know, try to save some money. Um, one thing that uh, um, I noticed is that it seems like you're out in the industry a lot and uh, you know, you're speaking, you're judging contests. Uh, so 
with the onset of the pandemic, have you started going crazy? In terms of lack of travel? <laughs> or just not, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, like, I just feel like for me personally, we were, you know, we were traveling, going to trade shows, like, or visiting, uh, you know, manufacturers and other companies, like at least twice a month. And at first it was, oh man, it's just nice not to be on a plane right now. And then like a couple of months in, uh, it was like, okay, I could, I could get back out there now. <laughs> so great question once again, but for us, I will say this, like we average attending about, hmm, I want to say it comes out to be 26 conferences a year we attend. Mm -hmm. And out of the 26 conferences, we probably attend at least six to seven networking events in person per month. So having a little bit of that break is good. I will say it really helps strengthen your relationships with the people that you are connected with. Something we did uh, is that I actually wrote a handwritten letter uh, called a letter of positivity where I enclosed a, a, a poem of hope. Oh. Um, and I actually cut out the poem and I, I ended up writing over a hundred plus letters to people. Okay. Um, just to kind of keep in touch. So, but the other thing is too, I have, I have, I used to have a satellite office in Vegas. We shut that down since COVID just mm -hmm. having to go out to Vegas, but we have another office in Portland, Maine. So I'm in Maine a lot. I've been in New Jersey, New York, I've already done several uh, trips down south as well, too. Obviously, doing all the COVID protocols and getting the testing done and all that stuff. But I will say a, pretty much since mm, June, it, it hasn't feel like I, I've, I've been landlocked. Though, okay. ironically, my assistant said when I finally went away in June, she's like, oh, my God, Dr. David, you know, you, you haven't traveled in, in five months. I'm like, is that a long time? She's like this is the longest stretch in nine years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my goodness. Uh, so, you know, is there any other, uh, you know, given your extensive, Oh, actually one thing I wanted to ask is that since you started in the industry back in 2009, you know, do you feel like has, do you feel like your role in the industry has changed going from sort of new uh, novice in the industry to now, you know, very recognized, very trusted resource in the industry. Like, have you sort of seen your role change uh, within cannabis? I have, I, I truly have one as a medical professional. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a lot more forthright, a, a lot more advocate about it. I, I challenge a lot of my fellow medical professionals on why they are not talking about it to their patients. Mm -hmm. And I really push that upon them. The other thing is too, is that I, there's a fine line because of the experience. You never want to poo poo on someone's dreams or hopes. Mm -hmm. And I've won uh, what they call the tough love award for some of these cannabis groups I'm part of okay. and at conferences when I give lectures, because I've, I've been through it. I can speak firsthand. Mm hmm the fine line that I really see and what bothers me are the people who are coming out of the woodwork over the last year to two years saying, Oh, well, why can't you just help me for free? Or, you know, right. why can't you, well, you know what we've been doing. You've had plenty of time. You're jumping on the bandwagon, but it's also seeing people take advantage right. of, of others. And, and here's a great example on the East coast it is extremely, extremely expensive to open up your own dispensary or to open up your, your own grow facility. And I've seen uh, consultants, I've seen lawyers say, oh yeah, you can do it for like less than a half a million dollars. That's total BS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you pay me your $30,000 retainer fee, I'll help you get everything up and running. Well, no, you're not gonna get anything up and running. It's you're taking advantage of someone and of their hard earned money. Mm -hmm. And that's where I get what they're trying to accomplish, but it's also, you don't have the experience. Mm -hmm. And when, when I give my public speaking and I, I, I introduced, I I'm very, I'm very uh, forthright and very blunt. Hey, I've been in you for over a decade. I've mm -hmm. done seven campus companies in five different states. Kind of like when you and I started the conversation, I, this is what I've done. Mm -hmm. This is why maybe you should listen to me while I see other people who are doing a lot of public speaking, doing a lot of interviews, but they've never opened up a business in cannabis. Mm -hmm. They've never actually have worked in other States for cannabis. Mm -hmm. And I think it's great. They're getting the word out, but I think you need to be a little more forthright 
yeah. on, on how you're projecting. And that's where I've, I've really find that fine line of, I don't want to be like the grandpa in the room or be the Debbie Downer, but you have to give that, that face of truth in reality. Right. Do you think, what is, uh, you know, what is sort of devalued the role of like, not consultant or advisor, but just advice where people think, you know, it should come for free. Is it because, you know, of the collaborative nature of the cannabis industry, or is it just that some people are going to try and get whatever they want for free? Uh, it's the first part, uh, yeah. the collaboration of the industry. And, and the reason I say that is that back in 2009, 2010, when I got involved in this industry, there wasn't a lot of research. There wasn't a lot of data. Mm-hmm. Now you have all these publicly traded companies. You can go pull up their financials. You, you can go and do all this recon work. There's, there's, when people say, oh, well, how do I get involved in cannabis? I'm like, it's called Google. You ever heard of it? <laughs> it? Like, it's not that tough, like, to join your state association. Like, there's so much information out there. Mm-hmm. And, and that's where people are like, oh, well, you should give me the information for free. I'm like, no, do some recon work. Mm-hmm. How real are you about this? And we work with multi-million dollar companies that have nothing to do with cannabis then they hire us to say, okay, UCS advisors, we want 15% of our business to come from cannabis. We want to build a cannabis vertical. How do we do that? See, that's mm-hmm. a mature way of doing it. Right. And, and this is where uh, everyone, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on insurance agents. I'm going mm-hmm. to pick on fractional CFOs. I'm going to pick on lawyers right now. We have phone calls from those two, three groups every week. Hey, can we pick your brain for two hours to mm-hmm. see what we can do? No, you can pick up brain for a half hour. That's going to cost you. Well, why <laughs> don't you want it to te- No, because how serious are you about this? Right. You know, what are you trying to do? What recon work, you know, how much do you really want to do? So that's where it's also, if you went to an accountant, you went to a lawyer, they're going to help you to a degree, but eventually you're going to have to get the paid advice. Mm-hmm. And what we tell people is that in cannabis, it's like any other sector. If you were to go open up a franchise, David, you go to, the different type of outlets out there that teach you about how to open franchises. Mm-hmm. If you were to open a, uh, let's say your own personal training center, there are personal training associations that teach you how to do that as well too. Mm-hmm. You know, you're paying for all these things. Same exact thing. So you said that uh, you haven't been able to put about, uh, put like the 10 hours a week in. Uh, do you plan on, uh, you know, still practicing uh, through the entirety of your career? Wow, that's a, that's such a trick question right there. It's such a good question. Putting me on the spot, would I still like to, in the ideal world to maybe treat 20 hours a month? I would mm-hmm. just to keep my skills up. Mm-hmm. The, the, the 10 hours a week, it was mainly the patients I've been taking care of on and off for the last 15 years. Okay. It wasn't like I was taking a lot of new patients. It wasn't like, oh, hey, every Monday I'm walking into a clinic and no, like I, I right now I'm very blessed. I have, as I mentioned before, Numerous employees that own their own businesses. I have several of my uh, former employees that all own their own physical therapy clinics. If they're in a pinch, they need help. Yeah, I'll go and I'll help them. Like mm-hmm. I, I get it, and I, I have a skill set. Okay. And but I, I, as I joke around, um, I'm going on my third career. <laughs> I I did everything I wanted to accomplish as a physical therapist. Been there, done that. God bless me. Then I took a company public, and I was a CEO of a public trade company. Been there, done that. Great experience. And now, you know what, I'm in charge of UCS advisors and this is uh, the main thing for the next five years. Are there any takeaways that you'd like to make sure that the Cannabis Equipment News audience knows about uh, yourself or UCS that we haven't otherwise covered? Yes. Make sure you get three quotes for everything. Even if you fall in love with a piece of equipment, go and do your homework. Mm -hmm. I see better and better salesmen in this industry. And they are taking advantage and using the most typical marketing sales tricks to land the novice cannabis business owner. Yeah. And I see them being taken advantage of all the time. So no matter what, get three quotes on everything. All right. What's the, what's the worst marketing trick you've seen so far or recently? Worst marketing? I won't say anything worse. If it works, then technically it, it's or good. Work, yeah. uh, I, I, think, I think the biggest one is which I see a lot more now with uh, these pop-up cannabis consultants mm-hmm. is one, don't, don't, how can I take a professional if you're using a Gmail or a Hotmail address? Really? Like <laughs> you can't get your own, like, but, but I love this. Hey, enter, enter this contest and you might win X, Y, and Z. 
mm-hmm. next week. You didn't win, but I, I'm going to give you a, a, a discount on my services if you do this. I'm like, really? Mm-hmm. Really? Mm-hmm. Like, you're just capturing my email address. You're just, that's all you're doing. Like, you know, you, you probably didn't have anything that you're really giving out at all. Um, <clears throat> that and, and the other thing is, too, is, um, you know, I will say the better the Shotsky uh, that, you know, for the giveaway at the events, the more business you get. Oh yeah. Oh, and like I, I still have some classic ones, like some of the ones behind me, I, yeah. I, I still have because they've been phenomenal. I will say, uh, for a little while, the uh, the free giveaways went downhill. Yeah. In the sector, then went back up a little bit, but uh, in general, realistically speaking, what I tell everyone is the following: is that get three quotes for everything. Okay. Mm-hmm. The other thing is too, you don't necessarily need a three or five year business plan but you have to have an exit strategy for your investors. Mm-hmm. And the third thing I tell people is this, make your money work for you. Mm-hmm. And this isn't a plug for my company. This is just basic common sense. And let's use even numbers. If you have $50,000, okay, and you want to eventually open up your own business, but you're not going to open up your business for six or nine months, take 10% of that 50000 which is $5,000, and invest it in something. Yeah. Make your money work for you. One of the biggest things that we see is that people will have a couple hundred thousand dollars and I'm going to do this in cannabis. I'm going to do that in cannabis, but I'm waiting for the state to, to do X, Y, and Z. Well, your money's earning almost nothing in that bank accounts. Take part of that money and invest it. And here's another secret, David. When you invest in another cannabis company, you're an investor now. They lift up the hood of the car and let you look at the engine and they will teach you. And a lot of these state applications will ask you, do you have prior cannabis experience? When you're an investor, another cannabis company, that answer is now, yes, I am. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. use that opportunity to go learn. And something that we really did and was interesting, some of our investors we had in our testing labs wanted to do other aspects of business and cannabis. They would come by the lab, talk to us all the time, they would ask us questions on a bi-monthly basis. They'd say, hey, what conferences are you attending? We'd like to go as well, too. And for them, it's a very easy way to start to learn about the sector. So instead of just throwing your money away, make your money work for you. No, those are uh, really good tips, man. Thank you a lot for sharing those. And I got to say, the tchotchkes, I used to work with this one woman, and we would walk the trade show floor, and she had a bag just dedicated to tchotchkes. And it's not like they were going home for anybody like, ah, getting them for the kids. I think she just had a room of them. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I believe I, I will say the, my favorite Shotsky mm-hmm. is uh, the free mini cannabis containers. Oh, yeah. yeah because yeah. they come and go. Sometimes you get some great ones and then other ones like nothing. And I, I, I'll admit I, I'm that guy. Like it's an hour before the end of the show. I'll go back to that booth, say, hey, those really, really nice glass containers you have any extra to like give it like 20 or 30. Do you want to fly those back to wherever you're going? No, great. I'll take them for you. (laughs) Right on, right on. Um, Well, Dr. David, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. I really do appreciate it today, man. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, I appreciate you. You having me on. Um, Hopefully your audience got some, some green nuggets of information that's benefit to them. And the medical guy in me always says, this is that hopefully you got at least one piece of information that you can utilize right away. If you Absolutely. did, th- th- then I'm very happy about that. Very good. Very good. Well, thanks again, man. I really do appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you for listening to the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast.